everybody and their neighbor. I'm Jet Stone. Welcome back to Gear and Gigs. So glad you guys could stop by. Today is uh, an interesting show. I can't wait to tell you about it. But first, our uh, our director has instructed me that uh, in no uncertain terms that I must remind you guys to uh, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, please like and subscribe. And if you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, please do so. We appreciate your support. Today on the show, we've got uh, one of my favorite people and uh, one of the people we've probably talked about on the show a, a number of times, Brian Meter, the, uh, the hello, manager hello, hello. Of, of, of the Guitar Sanctuary, which is, you know, guitar heaven to those of us here on the show. How you doing, Brian? Good morning, Jed. How are you? I'm doing good. Oh, we're doing okay. Now, just to let people know that, listen, in the future, we are currently doing this podcast uh, through, the, uh, the, <laughs> through the wonderful uh, auspices of Zoom uh, because yeah. we are in the middle of the – fantastically exciting COVID-19 virus. So we are practicing social distancing by about, uh, I guess, about 12 miles, if I'm not, not mistaken. Yes, we're, the, the glory that is, uh, you know, uh, the, the benefit for Zoom's existence and stock value, uh, COVID-19, but, uh, you know, the right. bane of everything else. If anybody engineered it, it's the virus. It's Zoom is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm thinking it's Zoom, uh, it's Amazon, it's Purell. Oh, there you go. Uh, Charmin. Uh, you know, not that we don't all love all those companies, but good gracious. Yeah, I didn't have the fondness for Charmin in the past that I have now, that's for sure. I, <laughs> well, I, I you know, I think I, I, as much negativity has come out of the whole thing, um, it is really interesting to see all the creative people that locked up to their own devices at their homes have been doing some really interesting creative things. Um, obviously, we're all friends with a bunch of musicians or follow lots of musicians online and things. And um, the one cool thing to see come out of it is the musicians that have really dived into the use of technology and figured out ways to continue to be creative even when they can't be in the same room as other musicians or people. And I'm seeing lots of really interesting online collaborations going on that you maybe wouldn't have seen where it's, you know, the drummers here from this band and they're in California and the guitar player is in, you know, Florida and the bass players here and they're doing tunes together virtually. Um, and I think it, it's led to some really interesting collaborations that I've seen. Um, I saw a thing the other day with Charlie Hunter and Greg Koch that was super cool. Uh -huh. um, so, I think the the only kind of cool thing that's coming out of this whole thing is you are seeing some interesting um, artists doing some interesting artistic work um, in the face of this thing. You know, um, our buddy Andy Timmons has been doing a bunch of stuff with Stage It. And Andy is the first guy that will admit to you he's kind of a, a bit of a technophobe and he uses it as a means to an end. But... And, and he has this website that he does instructional lessons, but, you know, he dive, he dips his toe in as much as he needs in most cases. And he's had a lot of people say to him for a long time, man, you should do this or you should do that. Or you should be doing video things or Skype lessons and stuff. And he really kind of um, bombed out with a lot of that stuff um, uh, with, you know, not doing it because he just, you know, didn't have the time or didn't have the emphasis to do it. And now he's kind of dived um uh, in a, you know, all in way where he's been doing these stage it events on Saturdays. Um, and, uh, you know, doing songs from specific albums or doing theme shows and he's having his fans request certain songs or asking questions and things. And it's been a new way for him to interact with fans. And, you know, there's a lot of fans that for him, he doesn't have the opportunity to do big giant world tours and that kind of stuff. So you may have people in countries that he's never played there before, or they may never have the opportunity to see him live. And now you can see him perform right, uh, you know, right at home, right in a minute, you know, in the modes of, you know, his home studio thing. And you can actually request a song in a personal way or hear him talk about a composition of his and stuff. And man, what a cool way to be able to interact with somebody that you're a fan of or that you admire. Now, for those of us uh, <clears throat> listeners that don't know what stage it is, can you just kind of give them a brief rundown of what that is? So stage it is an online platform that for doing, um, uh, uh, you know, 
online performances, essentially, um, uh, where you can basically, it's, it's not like a Facebook Live thing or something like that, where it's only up for one time, you know, it's up and then it stays up permanently, or you do a YouTube thing and you can always watch it. It's a true live performance. You can only watch it um, uh, where you can, you essentially buy a ticket for the show um, and you're usually pretty inexpensive. You can also virtually tip the artist um, it, through you buy these kind of tokens or credits that you use to help um, patronize the performers. Um, it's usually in a pretty more intimate, stripped down environment. Um, I got turned on to it from my friend Pete Ebick, who uh, plays guitar with Brett Michaels. Oh. And they've been doing it for several years where after a lot of concerts, Brett will go to the back of the tour bus and do like a 45 minute acoustic set. And people again can request songs and um, he will, you know, Brett does a ton of stuff for um, the diabetes foundation, especially for juvenile diabetes. And so he'll do things at every show where he auctions his hat and he'll sign it or his bandana or he'll auction guitars. So he'll do the same kind of thing on stage it where if you're the high tipper, um, you, you can get his autographed guitar or hat or stuff. And he does a lot where he's donating those funds to the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation. Nice. So nice. Pete had been talking to me about it for a long time. And then when all of the pandemic kind of struck, um, I brought it up to a few people, including Andy, of, hey, this is an opportunity for someone like you. Because, you know, Andy is a professional musician. He makes his living making music. That's how he pays his mortgage. Right. And so if you suddenly go, hey, there's no sessions you can go do anymore and there's no live gigs you can go and play anymore and you can't go to a studio right now and track an album, uh, people like that are suddenly having to scramble to figure out, well, man, how am I going to put food on the table? How am I going to make that mortgage payment? How am I going to take care of you know my family? Um, and I know for Andy, it's been a cool experience for him to kind of dive in and learn the technology but i think it's also a way for him to interact with some of his fans in a new way um in a more intimate way um so it'll be interesting to see that once all of the dust settles from the pandemic and we can get back to you know whatever normalcy is going to be because i don't think normal is going to be what we remember as normal anymore um it'll be interesting to see how they make that part of their ongoing strategy. Um, I know for here at the Guitar Sanctuary, we've got our venue next door, the Sanctuary Music and Events Center, where we do tons of concerts and things, which um, unfortunately has been dormant now for two months. And we don't know yet when the next opportunity is going to be for us to actually hold a live concert and what that's going to look like. You know, are we going to have to limit how many people can come or those kind of things? So we ourselves are taking a look at things like Stage It and other platforms as a way to um, do we sell virtual tickets for shows? Do we have a band here and we have a video stream and some of the crowd is physically here, but some of the crowd is watching online and they're buying a ticket through something like Stage It or one of those platforms? You know, um, is that what the new reality is, at least for the end of 2020? Yeah. And, you know, all the prediction models have changed so many times. It's tough to say what's going to happen. But it's nice to see that some musicians are stepping up, finding new ways to do stuff like that. I I, uh, I know Andy a little bit, and, and you're right, he's not a technophobe, but he's not uh, the, the on the bleeding edge of technology when it comes to this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of nice. I think mostly because he's just been traveling all the time doing live shows, and now he's yeah. well, got for some of the guys, the time. It's you know, for somebody like a, an Andy Timmons, the reason that he's so good at being what he is on guitar is because that's a lot of his focus. Right. So the time to sit and learn technology or gear, that kind of stuff, he's busy playing, he's busy writing, he's busy composing, he's playing on other people's records, he's doing those things. Well, now that he, like everybody else, has the time to go, well, maybe I should dust off that recording interface. Maybe I need to learn how to use Pro Tools or GarageBand or Logic or whatever you're going to use. Um, I know from the standpoint of the store, the big trends that we've seen in gear during the pandemic um, has been a lot to do with um, recording, you know, tones at lower volumes at home. A lot of the reactive loads and uh, reactive load IRs or um, boxes like the Strymon Iridium um, or the DSM Simplifier you know, the focus for the electric players is, okay, I'm stuck at home. 
my wife is working from home doing her Zoom meetings or whatever, my kids are doing online learning, it's probably not the best time for me to fire up my dual rectifier and, and uh, shake, the, shake the walls down. How can I still play? How can I still, you know, practice? How can I still, how can I maybe record? How can I get my amp to be at a, a controllable level for this situation? Um, so we've seen a lot of that. And then we've had a huge um, run on acoustic guitars. Really? Um, and I think that that's part of the other thing, too, is simply, well, I'm home and everybody's around. So it's probably a little friendlier for me to play acoustic guitar at home right now instead of cranking up my electrics. Um, so we've seen a lot of acoustic guitar sales um, and things like that. And we've had customers asking us more about you know, well, how can I get that amp into my Pro Tools or into my computer, um, that kind of stuff. So um, it's definitely going to kind of push some people into new directions um, in that way and trying to figure out, you know, it's uh, what's the, the saying, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. Now everybody has to figure out how, how do I do this? I mean, how many people do we all know that ever used Zoom, uh, you know, before March? Right. You know, um, and now everybody's probably a pretty good Zoom expert. I'm seeing people with custom backgrounds and all these things for their meetings and stuff that, yeah, this you know, is you fake. wouldn't launch that stuff. Yeah, this is just a fake drop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're broadcasting that. Hey, I once went to Michael Irvin's house, and uh, he does a lot of his NFL network stuff in his garage, and he has a portable camera rig, and he has an electronic backdrop behind him, um, and that's where he shoots a lot of that stuff, so... Um, but, you know, people are, I think we're going to come out of this with a lot more people used to Skype and Zoom and FaceTime and being more comfortable on the computer thing. And, you know, will employers and staffs figure out, well, maybe we don't need everybody here at the office all the time. Maybe we could do more with people working remotely and working from home. Maybe they're more productive in that regard. Um, you know, maybe we could help fight a little bit of the traffic stuff because everybody doesn't have to be driving to work every time. Um, so it'll be, uh, I think it'll be kind of interesting to see what's the, what are all the things that change moving forward because of the pandemic. Yeah. And it, it's interesting that acoustic guitars have made a resurgence and bicycles, mm -hmm. from what I understand, have made a huge resurgence as well. A lot of people that I talk to that I can't remember ever having ridden a bike since I've known them are suddenly saying, yeah, I'm going on these long bike rides. And it's kind of funny on one end, we're embracing all these virtual computer based solutions. And then at the same mm -hmm. thing, we're kind of be going, well, yeah, but let's play acoustic guitar and ride bikes. <laughs> well, and, and puzzles, like and when, puzzles. when has the puzzle business ever had a better, uh, you know, sales trend right now. We've got a big puzzle on our dining room table right now. We're in the middle of it. We've had this puzzle for, you know, 10 years around the house, we've never broken it out. And we're finally like, Hey, mm -hmm. that was a good time for a puzzle. So yeah, it, in some ways it's, it's, you know, if you've ever had to look at anything, having a double edged sword, I'd say that, you know, this is one of the prime examples. We've really seen a lot of positives, the pollution dropping and people having to, you know, recognize their families again and remember why they mm -hmm. got together in the first place at the same time as all the, the fear and the stress and the, and the tension and the change. It's, it's, um, it's an unusual combination of things that have come together. It is. Overall, yeah. I mean, it's doing pretty well. Admirably, it, I think. It's the classic squeezing the balloon. You know, you squeeze the balloon in the middle and it swells at both ends. So it's interesting to see the, you know, where it kind of all leads. Um, you know, for music, it's going to be really interesting to see, um, you know, what happens with live music for the rest of the year and kind of moving forward, um, you know, like for, you. for us taking a look at it you, you know obviously we're dependent on what the governor's um direction is and things like the cdc and directions from the state of texas and you know from the local counties and from uh, the cities um but even when things start to get to reopen uh, you know which of course everybody wants to do in a safe way uh you know I would imagine it's all going to go slow at first. So is it going to be 10 people are allowed in a, in a place or a business at a time? Well, you know, how do we do a concert if we've got 10 people? Um, and, you know, we're trying to look on that horizon of going, so what is the month? As we work with all the promoters to reschedule dates for all of the artists, um, 
we're all kind of sticking our finger in the wind to try and figure out. So September, is that going to be enough? Is it, do we need to look at November? I've got promoters rescheduling things for into the fall of next year. Um, I just had a promoter we have coming up in July that asked me to hold a date for August of 2021 for the potential reschedule. And of course with the artists, they're all, especially the artists that on the level that we have coming through the sanctuary where you've got, you know, um, we're a 300 seat venue. So you're dealing with mid tier artists that are booking regional tours. So they're having to put together a string of dates in a state like Texas and Oklahoma and Arizona and make their way kind of across the country. And they're in vans, they're not in planes. And so for the promoters, they're having to deal with, well, what if Texas has opened, but Oklahoma hasn't, and Arizona hasn't, and Louisiana has this restriction, how do they put together their string of tour dates if they don't know how each individual state is going to open back up? Right. Um, you can't, for them, they can't go, well, we can do these three dates, and then we have to skip over these two other states to get to this other state here that might be open. That's not financially viable for most of these artists. Well, especially if you get into the state and they say, oh, welcome, uh, you have a 14-day quarantine before you can go anywhere. <laughs> exactly. You know, it took us a month um, to get across two states. You know, are we as a venue going to have to have a thermometer uh, with a person with a thermometer at the door and we check everybody's temperature before they're allowed to come in? Um, you know, I wonder, is the next generation of the iWatchy Fitbit kind of thing going to include some type of monitor for your temperature and other stuff? And there's an app on your phone that you have to show to get scanned before we can let you in the building. Interesting. Um, you know, when you go to the doctor, they give you some kind of certificate and that's good for 30 days and that gets you into certain places. You know, uh, how are we going to get on airplanes, um, you know, for things? Uh, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see that kind of stuff because people are going to be itching to get back out and do stuff and get yeah. back to normal. Um, but how do we all do that in a safe way? And, you know, uh, you got to think about your family and your extended family. So if you decide you're going to that show and you're near that person who might have been exposed, are you bringing that home? And then that gets to your grandparents or to your, your parent or you expose your kid who exposes their friend to it, who exposes it to their elderly grandparent, and now they get the virus, you know. Um, yeah. So I think there's a lot of stuff to be worked out, um, and I don't know what's going to be the future for, you know, uh, concert events or sporting events or any of that stuff for the rest of this year. Yeah, well, it's, and we are in sort of this in-between phase right now where we don't have – any good treatments, we don't have any good vaccines or anything like that. So mm -hmm. once that's addressed, I think people will, there'll be a, you know, a sense of relief that at least if I get it, I can get treated. It doesn't mean yeah. a breathing tube or, you know, whatever. Or, even if we don't get to more advanced detection methods, once we get past that hump, I think things will go back to, well, yeah. whatever. Well, like I said, I, I think it's kind of interesting is. in terms of the creativity we're seeing. Um, Hopefully, uh, like for us in our business with the guitar players um, and musicians, um, you know, maybe people have had time to, to dig out that guitar. I've heard some from some of our friends and customers that are going, man, I'm, I've, you know, I'm so back into playing now. I've played more now than I've played in the last five years because I've had all this time. I'm, re you know, I'm uh, remembering why I got that guitar that's been sitting maybe in the closet for a little while and hadn't been getting all the play. They're digging out their pedals. Um, we're still seeing a ton of uh, business with pedal board building uh, with stuff. Cause I think it's that time where everybody's going, okay, all those projects that I've been putting off, uh, man, I really need to learn how to use pro tools or man, I really want to work on my blues chops or man, I, I need to fix that pedal board or man, maybe I need to retube that amp or, get my guitar set up or restring this or that kind of thing. Now everybody has that time um, to do that kind of stuff. Well, we finally got you on the podcast. So uh, exactly. You exactly. You know, um, so people are having that kind of time to do those things. You know, uh, we've been working with our friends at True Fire this month. Um, for April, they're doing their Egg Hut promo. And if you're a True Fire uh, subscriber, um, doing their stuff with their online lessons, which is a really killer platform for, for lesson stuff. Um, as you go around to the various lessons, you can find um, the eggs, um, you know, like an Easter egg kind of thing. 
And at the end of the month, whoever's got the most eggs, there's a series of prizes that people are going to win. And we worked with them to put together the prize pack for that. So like the, the top prize for it is a signed um, Andy Timmons Ibanez uh, ATZ 100 signature guitar. Um, so is Andy doing like it on Truefire? Through Truefire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, but Andy and is so doing lessons on Truefire? So Andy has a, Andy has three different courses on Truefire. Um, we got together with them. Um, I've known Brad and the folks at Truefire for a really long time since they kind of were in the early days of their infancy and kind of the early days of the internet for everybody. Um, and I reached out to them about, you know, hey, can we do some stuff for some promos for our customers during this whole situation? Because what better time is there for people to dive into bettering themselves as a player than right now? Sure. Um, and as part of that, we, you know, they approached us about this egg hunt thing. And so when we put it together, we looked at all of the artists that are on the True Fire platform that have played at our venue um, and are friends of ours. So you've got people like Josh Scott and you've got people got like, um, or Josh Smith, rather, uh, Josh Scott from JHS. Hey, Josh. Um, but Josh uh, Smith. Inadvertent shout out. And people like uh, Ariel Posen and Andy Timmons um, and our buddy uh, Corey Congilio, who does a lot of work with Fishman and Two Rock and Martin on the industry side, um, and Mimi Fox and David Grissom and Andy Wood, um, that are all, you know, um, uh, great players and good friends of ours that all do stuff on that platform. So when we put together this whole prize pack, we picked out gear um, that was all stuff that they actually use, not just, hey, here's a random pedal or a random guitar or that kind of thing. But, you know, there's a there's an even tied H9 because Josh Smith has one on his board and uses it for a ton of stuff. All of his cool Leslie sounds and stuff come from that. Um, and uh, Andy Wood, um, the, the Sir Koji comp compressor is kind of a staple on his board or our buddy David Grissom, the Strymon El Capistan is always on his board. So we, we, we wanted to put some thought into it rather than just kind of randomize prizes. Um, yeah. But, you know, that's a cool platform for people to dive in. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of those kind of platforms out there um, that people can use to, to go and learn and expand their playing. Man, it's so much more than when I first started playing or when you first started playing. Um, there's so many more resources out there for people these days. Um, and, you know, what better time than right now for you to go, all right, let me challenge myself. Let me go put on that funk lesson, even though you've never played funk guitar. Or I've never played funk guitar. Uh, let me go try some of those licks and see if I can add some of that to my repertoire. Um, let me go look at some of those jazz things and, and you know, learn some of those kind of more crazy chords. Um, let me just do something that kind of um, pushes me or uh, breaks the ruts a little bit more. Now, we've talked a little bit about the gear. Um, let's be sure and do a shameless plug for the Guitar Sanctuary in McKinney, Texas. Um, we'll, we, uh, we'll follow this up with some contact information so people know how to get a hold of you guys. But tell people a little bit about the shop because we've mentioned it, of course, on the show. But, um, you know, I, I tend to wax romantic about the place since I am so in love with it. So maybe you can talk about it in, in more objective terms. Tell us a little bit about how it got started. Which uh, well, thank you. Um, our, our owner and founder, George Fuller, um, uh, had the vision for the store. Um, uh, he, with his wife, Maylee Thomas, who's a big singer here in the Dallas area. Um, George is a custom home builder and building contractor by trade, um, but has also been playing guitar since uh, his college days. Um, he's been in and around the industry for a long time. Um, he worked a lot with Jimmy Wallace um, in building the Dallas Guitar Show, um, the, uh, the Dallas International Guitar Festival. Um, he used to be co-owners with a recording studio called Sound Southwest. Um, and in along the stuff that he's doing, he's always kind of had this desire to like, man, one day I want to have like the, the coolest guitar store I could imagine um, kind of thing um, out there and just kind of always had the thought for it. And you know, in the era when all of the large chain stores started to come across the country and really expand, um, there were a lot of the old school mom and pop kind of shop um, stores that all kind of fell by the wayside um, that either tried to compete with them on a level and couldn't um, or just, you know, there were some of those stores that were real old school that it needed, you know, there needed to be kind of a modernization that was going on. But there were a lot of really cool stores that just, you know, couldn't survive in the economic times or the stuff they were faced with and kind of went away. 
and the industry got pretty homogenized where it was the same modeled inventory footprint at every store location and each one of those kind of stores. And it was a little bit more of a, uh, you know, dumbing down on stuff in some ways where it was, you know, a whole bunch of the same thing over and over and over. And there weren't as many of the kind of cool guitars and it wasn't the hang, you know, when I grew up in stores um, and, and I'm sure like you and, and George and a lot of our friends, you know, the music store was the place you went and hang to hang. That was the place that you met your other musicians. That's how you formed your band was you went to the music store and you went to their bulletin board and you put your, your, sheet up of you know guitar player looking for a band or you know band looking for a bass player and you had the little pull off strips of paper with i was the gonna phone say i've got a lot of friends off of those little one by half an inch little strips of paper yeah but that's how you did it or you hung out in the store and you waited until you saw somebody playing drums that you thought was cool and you went dude you know are you in a band what's your number um and you weeded out and you started to figure out who was the cool players in town or who wasn't but it was back in the day you know before, you know, obviously before the arrival of the internet, the way you learned about gear was you went to the cool store in town where the cool staff was excited about the gear and wanted to show you this stuff. It wasn't as much about, you know, hey, here's the box. Let's get in your hands as quickly as possible and get you out the door so we can get to the next person and put the next box in their hand. It was you went to that store and the sales guy knew you and uh, or salesperson, sales lady. Um, knew you and knew what kind of stuff you played, knew what you were into. And when you came in the store, they'd go, Oh, Jet, dude, you have got to see this cool pedal we just got in, or this cool amp we just got in, or this cool guitar. Um, because they knew you and they knew what you were into, and they were excited about the stuff, and they knew you'd be excited about it too. And it was less about a transaction as more as, man, we found this piece of gear that we think is super cool and we're so excited to turn other people onto it. And you had that vibe and you had that environment and um, a lot of that kind of got lost um, in a lot of the retail stuff. It just became homogenized. Uh, you had a lot of times where the, the staff were just clerks. They were just there to ring up your transaction. They didn't really know about the stuff um, or certainly they didn't have the same kind of passion about the stuff. And for our owner, George, um, you know, he likes really cool gear um, and he plays uh, with the band. They gig, you know, four to six nights every month um, doing shows all over the place. Um, and he wanted cool gear. And he started to find that in the Dallas area, he couldn't find a store like that anymore. All the cool stores that they used to go to were one by one kind of going away. And so he was having to buy gear online or he was having to drive down to Austin or go to Hill Country to find stuff um, or wait for the guitar shows to come around to find the kind of stuff he wanted. Um, and he realized that, man, if, you know, if I'm having this problem, then all the people that are like me are having the same problem. Um, and after an ill-fated trip to go down to Hill Country to try a guitar that he had been promised was in stock at a store and got there to find that, oh no, we sold it, sorry, we just hadn't updated the website, that kind of thing. Um, he voiced his frustration to his friend going, man, you know, if I had a store, we would do this, this, and this. And his friend said, you know, you keep talking about it, why don't you just do it? And George, being the person he is, went, damn it, yeah, I'm gonna do it. And within like two months, he had secured lines, had a space to go and was getting ready to launch the store. Um, and myself and my cohort Shane Frame uh, came on about a year later um, and uh, joined it. And the whole idea is to be, um, as the name implies, that sanctuary. Um, we want to be that experience that everybody used to have. We have a couch in the store. We have a t flat screen TV with, you know, concerts and sports and things running on it. We want the store to be like what every guitar player wishes their living room looked like. Um, so the the George built an amazing building that is done like one of his custom homes. Um, we're displaying the instruments in the way it would be at an art gallery or a museum. Um, there's no big giant price tags and all that kind of stuff on everything. We're, we're trying to feature the instruments that we love and that we appreciate. Um, and we try and um, work with manufacturers that we feel share that same kind of passion for um, the instrument where 
they're not skimping out on a part because, well, if, you know, if this pot costs 10 bucks and this other pot costs two bucks and I make 5,000 guitars, I'll save X amount of dollars. It's no, the only pot that's going to sound good in the guitar is the one that costs 10 bucks. And if that's what it costs, that's what it costs. Um, and they're not trying to cut a corner to save on a production expense or hit a certain price point. They're trying to build the best possible instrument they can build or the coolest pedal they can build or the best amp they can build. Um, and to your credit, your store does something that I've never seen in another music store do. I mean, you do lots of things to be quite frank that I haven't seen other stores do, but one of the most interesting things I think, and it, it falls in line with what you're talking about is that unlike every store that I know of that, that displays guitars sideways or at, a, at an angle where they're crowded together in a line like soldiers, yours are all facing front with space around them. So when you walk in, you can literally see every guitar. And when they wanted to show more of their inventory, other, rather than packing guitars tighter, they, you guys literally added a second floor and put more guitars up higher and, and gave people a way to go see them up there. I think that's, that's commendable. Yeah, I mean, you know, we're all fortunate because of George's amazing vision and his sense um, and his eye for stuff. Um, where we benefit is George is our customer. Um, he's a successful business person in some other field. Music is his passion and his hobby, but it's probably not how he earns his living. Um, he's got the means to have a nice house and have a nice car and, and, you know, wear nice clothes. And when he wants to buy gear, he wants to buy the really nice gear. Um, and it's not as much about price as it is form and function um, with it. And he wants it to be an environment where he can sit down and try a guitar and actually hear it and not have it be kind of as chaotic and crazy um, of an environment and have it be more of an experience rather than just a, let's get you in and get you out the door. Um, I mean, obviously we're here to sell gear, but we feel strongly that if we create the right environment, if we um, have the right relationship with our customers and the music community around, um, the business will happen. Um, uh, as Shane always says, we're not here to sell you anything. We'll help you buy it all day long. Right. You know, with most of the gear we carry, we carry the best stuff out there. So how much selling do we really need to do? It's more about, Hey, let's find that instrument that's going to get you excited and jazz you up and get you jonesing to go and play. And it just lights you up when you see it. And that's exactly how you've always dealt with me. You've sold me way more gear than I would ever want to admit to, but you've never tried to sell me any. There's never been a closing technique used on me. You know, I, you know, I, I've had a lot of sales training and I'm on this, on the lookout for that kind of stuff all the time. And that's not how you do it. You, you make me sell it to myself by, go, by getting me so excited or enthused about it that I walk out convincing myself there's got to be a way to get it rather than the other way around. And I think that's, well, I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. And look, you know, um, there's a ton of great stores around the country. Um, I'm good friends with um, a bunch of guys at a bunch of the cool independent shops out there. Um, and um, we want the industry to be strong. I want there to be cool places for people to go to around their, their local markets and that kind of thing. And of course, we ship stuff all over the country. And I've got customers, you know, we've got customers all over the country that we ship stuff to. Um, but you know, this type of stuff, this kind of retail, this type of experience, um, across the board in our country is slowly going away. Um, you know, um, I shop at Home Depot and Lowe's too, because they have all this kind of stuff, but man, I love going to that cool, funky hardware store, um, that's in your small town where you walk in and you can say to the guy, man, I'm trying to fix the thing. And he goes, Oh man, here, come here. And let me, let me take you over here to the perfect dial. And I'm going to show you the thing. And not only that, but I'm going to show you the tool that you didn't know exists that makes this job so much easier for you to do. And let me explain to you a couple of the things. Hey, when you do this, make sure that you're adjusting this or make sure you watch out for that or, you know, get one of these because those other ones are cheap and they'll break on you. Um, and they really care and they're there to help you. It's not just about a transaction. Um, and that's really what we feel. You know, um, Shane put together our program that we do at a local wine bar here called Zen Zen, uh, where we do our customer appreciation showcase. And we do that once a month. And it's really what it's about, which is hey, let's give our customers and our friends and our students and our teachers a platform to go and play. Because there's no way that you're going to get 
more inspiration to put in the work and put in the time and put in the effort and practicing and working on your tunes than the adoration you get from getting up and playing a few tunes and having people smile and clap and, and applaud for you and appreciate what you're doing. Um, there's nothing that will propel you more toward uh, working on your instrument than that kind of feedback. And we were struck by how many customers of ours would come in and you hear them in the store and go, man, what a great player you are. Where are you playing? Oh, you know, my house, my living room, uh, maybe their local church or something, but they're not out there in the scene. And probably it's because they're, uh, you know, a business pro or they're a teacher or they're so busy with life, with their job, with their families, with their kids, that the music has had to kind of take the back burner. And so they don't have a time to invest in being in a band or going to rehearsals, but they really need the periodic opportunity to play. So Shane created that platform to go, okay, I want you to come up and play. I want you to do three songs. Give me 15 minutes. We will put together people to back you up. If you need other musicians up there, you know, we'll, we'll sing with you. We'll play with you, but let's get you up there. Let's get you playing. There's too much talent there for you to not be sharing it with people. Um, and it's a different light. You know how it is. You, 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 for those couple minutes that you get to be on stage and all your friends and family come over to come watch you play. Now they see you in a different light. Now you're not their husband or their wife, the banker or the school teacher or the accountant for those 15 minutes. You're their husband, the rock star. Right. You know? uh, right. And man, that's, that's so important that in all of this stuff, the making of the music part is the part that sometimes gets forgotten or gets left out so much. And it's like, man, that's, that's why we all do this. Well, it's nice that you guys spend so much time like figuring out ways to give back or to enable musicians to be musicians besides selling them the best of the best. I, I think that's, um, that's a step beyond that uh, you don't see a lot of stores do, and especially stores that specialize in the higher end stuff. So that's really cool. We've, we've well, talked about, I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, I, I think that in this modern retail, um, whether it's a guitar store like us or whether you're a bookstore or a hardware store or whatever thing you're in, um, really the end, all of retail is kind of getting squeezed into two directions. You're either getting the mass merchant homogenized kind of experience that you're going to get at a chain store, that kind of thing. And hey, there's not really anything wrong with that. We all shop at them all. And there's a reason why they're so big and powerful. Man, I can pop in the one spot and I can go get my fertilizer for my lawn. I can pick up that loaf of bread that I forgot to get at the grocery store. I can grab the socks that I need for my kid. Um, I can get those screws that I need from a hardware project and I can, you know, uh, you know, grab some sodas or whatever, all in one st store. I can put it all in the one cart. It's one transaction. I made one stop and it's easy. So, I mean, we all understand why that works. We all understand why Amazon is so easy for everybody. You pull out your phone, you do a couple searches while you're at work because you remembered, oh crap, I got to get that thing for that project. You make a couple clicks and the thing shows up at your door that day or the next day and you didn't have to think about it. Um, so you're going to have that. And then I think that the independent retailers, for them to survive, you're going to have to be specialized. You're going to have to offer something more. You're going to have to offer an experience. Um, it's just like concerts, you know, all the bands are looking for ways to how do we differentiate our tour or our show? Well, it's those VIP meet and greets. It's the you pay the extra dollars and you get the front row tickets, but you also get to go watch sound check or you get to see the band do a quick acoustic set or you get to meet him or you get to take your picture with him or you can buy the signed guitar. It's all experience stuff. And, and I think for any type of retail store to thrive, if you're going to be uh, independent, you've got to figure out ways to engage with your customers and offer something different and, be that kind of haven for something different, you know, um, like a sanctuary, right? You know, we know most of our customers by name when they come in and we know, we ask them about their bands and where they're playing and what they're doing. Um, because we're genuinely interested and a lot of them, they're Guinea pigs for gear. I mean, we've done it with you. We've done it with other people. Hey, we got this thing. We know you do this kind of stuff. We want you to take it home and check it out and tell us what you think give me your feedback, go use this piece of gear. Like they say, it's supposed to be used um, and tell us what you think about it. Does it do the thing that you want to do um, and be engaged as opposed to just like, yeah, man, we've got them right there. Just grab one and you can ring it out right over there at the front counter. You know, it's, it, 
Um, we don't want it to be that way. Um, Shane and I um, have been in music retail. This is my 31st year in music retail. Um, and Shane is right up there with me. Um, and our guys like, you know, uh, you know, Trey uh, uh, is, I think, at like seven or eight. And, you know, he's one of the, the newbie guys. Uh, Daniel's been, you know, Daniel's an old soul. He's been in it, you know. He's a young guy, but, you know, he's lived long lifetimes in, in all the stuff he does and his love for vintage, repairing vintage guitars and stuff. Um, you know, if you bring your old acoustic guitar in for Daniel to take a look at, you're going to learn about the history of that instrument and where it was made and when it was made and why they made it the way that they made it and how they did the bracing and that kind of stuff, as opposed to just, yeah, it needs a trust rod just uh, kind of thing. And we want to be invested with that stuff. And I think that um, for a lot of stores, that's the way you're going to have to be if you want to survive in the in in the new areas and all the stores that I'm fans of and all of my friends in the industry that are doing well, they have similar kind of places um, with it. I've got a good friend of mine that owns a store in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I've got a good friend of mine that owns a store up in uh, Northeast Pennsylvania. Um, I've got a good friend, buddy of mine that owns a legendary store up in Chicago. We all get together for breakfast at NAM and we all talk each, to each other and we have a Facebook group together. Um, and we share stories back and forth and it's all kind of the same around the country. It's all, you know, what are you guys doing? And, and they're all doing well because they're also trying to reach beyond um, and not just be, you know, a place that you buy widgets, you know, hell for any of us, if we really wanted to be, you know, uh, making gobs and gobs of money, uh, you know, the, the joke in music retail is the easiest way to make a million dollars in music retail is to start out with 2 million. <laughs> you know, we, we, we do this because we're addicted to it and we don't know, we don't know how to do anything else and we can't do anything else. And we really, quite frankly, don't want to do anything else. You know, uh, Shane and I, our wives are always going, are you coming home? And, and it's like, well, let's see, I'm in this really cool place and I'm surrounded by amazing, cool guitars and I've got the couch and I've got the flat screen TV and there's a Starbucks right across the parking lot. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, honey, we're, uh, we're working on, uh, inventory or something. Um, I'll be home soon. Um, you know, uh, it's not like coming to work for us. You know, uh, I mean, hell I'm here at eight 30 in the morning. We don't open until 10 it's cause I'm excited to get started. I'm excited to start working on orders and updating the website and ordering gear in and that kind of stuff. And, uh, we're fortunate that like, when that box comes in from the Fender Custom Shop or from Paul Reed Smith or from Sir or from Tom Anderson or McPherson or Martin or Taylor or Mesa or Strymon or whoever it is, we're all still excited when it gets here. Um, if, you know, George is the mayor of our city, he's a custom home builder and building contractor. He is pulled in a million directions. He's busy all the time. If I want five minutes of his time, I send him a picture of a label from a box from a manufacturer that just arrived. <laughs> and tell him there's a cool guitar inside and usually within five minutes i hear his truck rumbling up front and he's on his way to some meeting or something but he's going to take five minutes to run in and look at whatever that cool guitar is yeah. and that's what still drives us you know um is that we still love the gear just as much as anything well luckily we're not numb to it and having it just be a box it's like man we get excited when a cool guitar comes in the store and when we get to sell it to a customer who's a friend of ours, um, it's kind of weird, like a piece of that guitar stays with you. Like we get as much of a high from turning one of our customers onto a cool piece of gear as you do almost from having it yourself. I believe that, I believe that. Uh, we, you've talked a little bit, uh, touched a little bit on some of the services you do, but kind of give the, everybody a rundown on what things you do. Besides selling the, the top-notch gear and the brands that you just mentioned, what other services do you guys do? Um, well, the, the big focus is for the store, of course, is guitar. Um, we're true to our name, Guitar Sanctuary. Um, we don't do drums. We don't do keyboards. We don't do, you know, um, PA systems or any of that kind of stuff. We're, we're focused on guitar. It's what we know and it's not what we love. So, we're, we're single minded in that regard. Um, we do, um, we have a great repair tech, um, Luthier Daniel Kirkland, um, who does amazing guitar repair and restorations. Um, he's the one who sets up and adjusts um, every guitar that goes out. So before we ship a guitar to a customer or when a customer is picking up a new guitar, um, it gets, it's, 
it's quality check from Daniel before it goes out the door um, to make sure that everything's just right. Uh, maybe somebody wants a custom gauge of string or specific tuning or they want it adjusted a certain way. We want to make sure that when you open that box or you open that case that it's ready to roll. Um, but also his passion is breathing life into old guitars that maybe have been a little uh, mistreated or distressed through the years and bringing them back to life. Um, he has a real passion for that, especially vintage acoustics. Um, and then we've got uh, Brian Emilian, uh, lovingly, AKA B2, um, who is our custom pedal board builder um, uh, with his company, Emilian Audio. Um, we literally have customers that ship their pedal boards from all over the country and all over the world to, to uh, Brian to um, build them for him, uh, wire them. He does uh, um, impeccable, immaculate wiring work um, with it and helps them out with doing things like custom switchers or custom interfaces and really works on custom pedal board layout and stuff. Uh, if you've ever wired your own board, you realize like it seems simple up front and then you start getting into the nitty gritty of doing it and then you go, oh man, and, that, and you realize why people go, hey, I'm gonna put all my stuff in a box and ship it to you and let you do it um, and then have you ship it back to me and then all I have to do is use it and play. Um, and a lot of creative guys, they're, you know, they don't have time for that stuff or that's not their field of expertise. They're players. They just want to play. Um, so we do all those custom pedal board builds um, with it. Um, we have a full performance academy where we teach um, in excess of about 300 students a week. Um, Shane Frame oversees all that stuff. We have about 15 instructors and we teach guitar and vocal and piano um, uh, and bass lessons um, right now. That's all virtual. Um, we've been amazed by how easy um, that transition has been and how our students have kind of really embraced that stuff, um, doing lessons by either um, FaceTime or Skype or Zoom um, and that kind of stuff and, and doing all those things. Um, and that's a really fun thing because when you get into the higher end kind of side, sometimes you forget the joy of um, a new kid who just finally put together those first three chords together in progression or first got that damn F chord, you know, or that learned that first bar chord or was able to sing that first song. Um, I'll never forget. We had a young kid who started lessons with us and he was about eight years old and his mom got him an acoustic guitar from us, a little small one. And uh, they came back later that afternoon because uh, he wanted to try and put a strap on it and didn't have a second strap button. And so we said, oh, yeah, hang on. You know, Shane put a second strap button on it. And the guy, the kid got the, the strap and put it on. And once he had that, he immediately did the guitar player stance. And he had such a grin on his face of like, yeah, now I'm a guitar player. <laughs> and it's so great because, you know, when you've been in and around it for a long time, sometimes you can forget that initial love you had for it and just how cool it was to like, put the guitar on for the first time and play through an amp loud the first time. And you didn't care about tone or whether it was true bypass or whether it had a silicone diode rectifier or tube rectifier, or was it a coily cable or that stuff? Now, I mean, the first amp I had was a Dean Markley K20. By comparison now, it's awful sounding. But it made distortion and I could make it loud and I didn't know any better and I didn't care. And it just, man, I plugged it in. And as soon as my parents would leave, I would turn that thing as loud as it could go and play every terrible chord I could play. And it was such a rush and it was so much fun, you know, and now because of the business we're in, it's easy to become a tone snob and you're thinking about this, thinking about that. And sometimes you lose sight of like, man, it's just fun sometimes to turn up an amp and play three chords and, pretend you're in Kiss or The Stones or The Who or Pearl Jam or Nirvana or whatever was your that band that kind of set you off on that stuff. So having all those students come through every week and seeing those young smiling faces that are excited about, you know, learning that first tune or learning that first thing or singing that first song um, is cool because you realize like, okay, that's that next generation, you know. Uh, Shane and I laughed at like, hey, that's our retirement program. We're growing our next generation of customers right now. And we better do a good job because 15 or 20 years from now, we need them to be buying guitars. Yeah. So that we can, that we can still come in every day, uh, you know, and not be playing shuffleboard or bingo or something. Now, something you said ties in real well to one of the, the best pieces of advice I've ever heard any um, 
anybody give any guitar players looking for good tone? And I've, I've mentioned to, to, you, to you that it, it has had an impact on me before. And that's your, and you, I'll let you phrase it, but it's your comment about a volume and, and tone. So give the give the kind oh. folks your philosophy on uh, that. So, so the the signature file in my email, everybody's got their signature file, um, you know, thing or their little blurb or whatever. Mine uh, simply says, um, there are very few tonal ills that can't be cured by turning the volume knob clockwise, uh, which in essence means turn it up. You know, all these. Uh, one of the big challenges we fight all the time with people, and, and I get it because, the, you know, the world is different now and uh, it's not the 1960s, the 1970s. And you can't just have your wall of marshals and, and fill the club that way. Um, but, you know, almost all of the tones that we all chase, um, be it from uh, Jimmy Page or The Edge or Jimi Hendrix or Van Halen or the Allman Brothers or whoever your favorite player is that got you excited about playing guitar. Um, none of those tones was created quietly. Um, chances are when they recorded those tracks, things were loud. Things were probably really loud. You probably didn't want to be in the same room with the amps and maybe they weren't. Maybe they were in the control room. Um, so this thought that you should be able to replicate those tones at bedroom or whisper quiet volumes, um, that's a, to me, that's just a big fallacy and a challenge for people. And most of this, ah, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. How are you getting that tone? I'm going, well, I turned the amp up a little bit, you know, it doesn't have to be deafening, but at some point it's an amplifier. That's its job. That's what it's meant to do. And some of those tones, there is no way to get them quiet. You'll never sound like Jimi Hendrix playing quietly in your bedroom. It just is never going to happen. Um, there's an interaction that happens between the guitar and the amp when it's turned up loud. And I, you know, I understand what uh, churches and clubs and places are going for um, in trying to limit stage volume and things like that. Um, and, you know, I, I know there was that shift from the rock club to the bands at restaurants where you're essentially the backing track for people having dinner. And so I understand it, but it's like, man, when, when did it be such a, become such a sin to play guitar somewhat loudly? You know, uh, I always say, Hey, when you first got that inspiration to play, mm -hmm. were you at somebody's bedroom where they were playing so quietly that they wouldn't offend their wife or their spouse or their kids? Or were you at a rock show where it was so loud that your shirt was vibrating? You know, chances are that's probably where it was. There's a certain psychoacoustic effect with, with volume and sound waves that you can feel. And I think also yeah. when you, the speaker box itself vibrating, because if the speaker is just resonating, but the, the cabinet isn't, it's not the same if you don't yeah. feel that. If you're not moving any air, if you don't have a little bit of volume, there's, it, there's a lot of that magic that just is lost. And, all of those tones that people use as kind of um, code words these days, plexi or recto or blackface or California or those kind of things. Um, the, the word plexi is legendary for a reason. If you've ever played a real plexi Marshall cranked up at seven or eight and stood in front of it, there's a magic that happens from that. That is a life altering experience. Um, so that plexi plug-in or that plexi-ish pedal or that thing, it might get you kind of in the neighborhood, but it's really not the same as playing through one of those kind of things, you know, kind of fired up. Um, so that's, that's just kind of my thing is most of the people when they're struggling with tone, and again, it doesn't, you don't have to be crazy loud, but you got to move a little bit of air to kind of get most of the tones people are going for. And, a lot of these tones that people struggle with, it's like, man, just if you turned your amp up just a little bit more, you'd probably find that a lot of those problems you're having would go away and that, uh, you know, uh, maybe you don't need quite as complicated a setup um, as you think you do uh, with it. Uh, you guys need a little prescription pad that, that you work. can send people home with that says, you know, you, you, prescription for good tone, you need to turn it up and that way they can give it to their wives or, or kids and go, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I wish that, you know, I, I tell customers all the time, you know, they're, they're searching for this solution for this or solution for that to get in good tones at volume and buying an attenuator or buying this thing or buying this other thing. And, and my thought is, man, if you made the same investment in soundproofing for your room or better yet, you know, yeah. for your significant other, 
on that Sunday afternoon when you really want to play, buy them tickets to the movie. Get them, uh, get them a, a spa day. Uh, buy them a, you know, get them a gift card for a cool lunch someplace. Send them out of the house for a couple hours. They'll be happy. You'll be happy. And you'll probably have tones that you enjoy, you know. It's easier to play when the guitar is singing with the amp, too. It's just yeah. easier to play. If you have a Porsche or a Ferrari, if you're driving it in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic at 35 miles an hour, you never experience why you bought a Porsche or a Ferrari. That is a good point. You experience that when you're doing 75 miles an hour down the highway and the thing's not even breathing hard and you can feel all that raw power under your foot. That's when you re go, oh, this is why I bought that sports car. You know, if you're just, if it's your everyday driver and you're driving in bumper to bumper traffic, you're not experiencing why you bought the car. And, you know, if you buy a hundred watt amp and you're wondering why you can't get good tones at a and bedroom practice levels, it's like, well, that's not what it's for. That's not why they designed it. They didn't design it for you to play in your bedroom. They designed it for, for you to stand next to a drummer with a double bass kid who's beating it hard so that you could turn up louder than that person and hear yourself and get good tone. Um, so that, you know, and I get it. It's, we live in a modern world and everybody's PC and everybody's trying to get good tones at low volumes and all that stuff. But, you know, man, listen to our buddy, Andy Timmons. He's got amongst the best tones on the planet. And he's usually using 200 watt amps with eight 12 inch speakers in a glorious stereo setup. And if you've heard him live, he is loud and it's glorious. And nobody, you know, when, when we're doing those shows and the staff will look at me and go, man, is he a little loud? And I go, man, everybody in this building came to watch him play guitar. There's not a person in this crowd that is bothered by how loud his guitar is right now. Because that's why they're here, because they want to hear him play. See, and now you've got all of our listeners dying to go fire up their, their tube amps and crank oh, them. Yeah. This is what he does to me. This is why I wanted you guys to hear this. Because uh, they come from a, a spot of genuine sincerity and enthusiasm about the industry, the artists, the gear. It's uh, what you guys do is pretty special, and I wanted to make sure people knew all about. Thank you. Well, and it's it's because of our customers that we're able to do it. Um, it's because of our customers that is why we do it. You know, because we're Jones. We like I said, we love this stuff, and we love turning other people onto this stuff. I lo love it when we talk to a customer and ask them about their what looking for and who their favorite players are, what are the tones that they're doing? And you know, right in your head, Oh, okay. This amp is going to slay you when you plug into it or this guitar or this pedal. And when they plug in and they play and they go, man, that's what I was looking for, man, that's a high. Yeah. Well, I, when you show me a new piece of gear or, or, or tempt me or, or tell me I need to go check something out, you have a gleam in your eye, but it's not the gleam that I see in, in a big box store where they just want the commission, your gleam is, I can't wait to see his reaction when he comes back and mm. tells me, oh my God, that's phenomenal. So, But you know what I mean? It's, it's, that's that kind of stuff. And it's easy for all of us to lose sight of that kind of stuff. But, you know, when you go to NAMM or you go to these other things, or you go to the Dallas International Guitar Festival or something like that, what's cool about it for all of us? Man, there's something cool about going and seeing a bunch of cool guitars. It's just like for those people that are into cars, why do you go to a car show if you got a bunch of cool cars? Because it's cool. Because it's fun. If you're into cars, you love seeing all cars, all cool cars, yeah. you know. Um, and we just, we, we want to be that destination. And, you know, wherever you, the listeners are for this, that you are, um, there's probably a store somewhere near you or in your area that's working really hard to do that for you, too. Um, you know, look, we love shipping stuff to you all over the country, too. And we'd love to have your business, too. But, man, there's a lot of cool independent stores out there that are working hard to do that same stuff. My, my buddies in the industry, are we all competitors? Kind of, but man, the, the country is a big place. There's 300 million people here. There's plenty of business to go around for all of us. I want to see cool music stores thrive and survive because I want that next generation of players to have those places to go to, to get them inspired and get them excited and have them have a cool time and have them find their community. You know, most musicians, were probably not athletes when you were in school or things like that. You were probably a little <laughs> outcast guy. You know, you were probably, um, music is where you found your tribe. Uh, music is where you found the people where you were like, oh, these are my people. I belong here. Th these are my friends. This is the people that I can hang with and talk with and, and come up with. 
So the world needs cool music stores. You need those places where you find that new person to play with in your band or that new cool piece of gear that sparks you. You know how it is. You buy that cool pedal or amp or guitar and you come home and you immediately write a new riff or a new song because of that new sound it made. That's cool. That's inspiring. Who, who didn't want a flanger after the first time you heard Van Halen Unchained or the first time you heard Barracuda from Heart? Mm. You know, um, who didn't want to figure out what a phase 90 is after you read the interview with Eddie Van Halen and he talked about that cool swooshing sound in eruption that nobody could figure out what it was. Um, you know, you read the guitar magazine or the interview with the edge to figure out how he was stacking his two delays together because nobody knew, had done that before and knew what that was going on. Wait, how's he getting that sound? Oh, well, I've got two delays stacked together on top of each other and each one's doing a different repeat. Well, now that's an industry standard sound, but it wasn't before. Somebody came up with that cool new sound. Um, and it's cool when you see companies like a Chase Bliss or a Maris or a Strymon where they invent pedals that you didn't know you had to have it until it came out. And then you went, oh my God, I have to have that. Um, you know, that kind of thing. It's still cool that there's people out there doing that kind of stuff purely from a creative bent, um, you know, with that stuff. I mean, how cool is Josh Scott with his YouTube channel where most of the time he's profiling other companies? His channel is not just look how cool our pedals are. Here's our next cool pedal. Let me sell you this other cool pedal. He's telling you all about why boss pedals are cool uh, or Chase Bliss pedals or whoever else's pedals are cool on his branded channel that's for his company. That's cool. Because why? Because he's into gear. Because he thinks it's fun. And he realizes that the more people that enjoy playing and enjoying gear, the you know, it's the rising tide raises all boats thing. It's if everybody's jazzed about cool gear and pedals, he'll get his share of the business. But if that people aren't excited about pedals in general, then his business is going to struggle. Yeah. Well, you guys are doing the same thing right now, telling people to support their local stores. And and uh, I think that sort of a unified approach to the industry and the community is great. I think that's it's um, self-supporting. Yeah, I mean, we're doing our you – know, look, I mean, again, you know, obviously we would love to have the opportunity for everybody's business, um, you know, and, and we want to continue to carve out our chunk of that. But we realize that the pie is really big. And that, again, if there's a network of cool stores that are doing and they're all thriving, that helps all of us. When there's not people excited about cool gear, then we're all screwed at that point. Um, so, you know, we want people out playing and doing their kind of thing. And look, man, if you have the piece of gear that they're looking for these days, they're going to find it. They're going to find it on their phone or their Google search or whatever they're going to do. And we're all going to get our piece of the pie. Um, but it's important that there are those cool stores around because – there's new kids today that are hearing music for the first time or hearing a rock band for the first time. And they're starting to get excited about, man, maybe I could do that or maybe I could play. Um, and that stuff's starting to get them excited. Um, and um, we need those kids to find a cool music store to walk into where there's a nurturing environment where they'll go, Hey, come on a little, you know, young young man or young lady yeah let's hook you up let's get you with lessons let's show you about this let's show you this cool piece of gear or this cool guitar or microphone or keyboard or drums or whatever it is um we need them coming up we need that next wave um arriving we need them to be playing uh guitar instead of playstation or online gaming or staring at youtube we need them playing an instrument yeah, well, that's the difference between a mercenary attitude towards retail and a an investment attitude towards retail. And, you know, it's, it's great to see that, that you guys are doing that. Now, I can hear the stores kind of heating up and you're getting some calls and things. I know you're getting we are. Up. Uh, Just about time for, uh, for us to hit DEF CON 1. So. so give everybody the, the contact information that they should need to, to get a hold of you, especially now during these times. Um, so it's, you know, pretty simple, guitarsanctuary.com. Um, we'll get you to the main hub of stuff. Um, of course, we have our Reverb store and we have our eBay store and we have our Amazon store and all that stuff too. Um, on Facebook, um, it's facebook.com slash guitar sanctuary. Um, on Instagram, we are the guitar sanctuary. So you can see us on all of our channels there. Um, we've got our YouTube channel as well and that type of stuff too. Um, so 
you know, we're always trying to do what we can to post cool gear and cool uh, reviews and all that kind of stuff out there. Um, but yeah, you can get us at all those channels. Um, you can call us at nine seven two five four zero six four two zero um, as well. Give us a shout there. But we're trying to do what we can to support everybody and keep them all making music while all this stuff's going on. So, you know, if we need to mail you a pack of strings, we can mail you a pack of strings. If we need to mail you a guitar, we can mail you a guitar. If we need to send you a pedal, we can send you a pedal or an amp for that kind of stuff. Or, man, if you're trying to figure out how do I hook this up to that kind of thing, give us a call. We'll help you walk through it. You know, we want to get everybody playing. We want to keep everybody going. Um, and like I said, we're all pretty excited to see the amount of creativity that's coming out of this. You know, maybe that will be the, uh, the leftover of the pandemic is all the cool um, new ways that people figured out ways to connect and to make music. Uh, and hopefully when we're all allowed to be around each other, people will kind of take that moment to value human interaction a little bit more. You know, I think this is really teaching everybody, yeah, it's cool, you can do all this stuff online and have this cool online community, but man, I miss hanging out in the, in the, in the coffee house or the restaurant or the bar or the concert hall with my friends and my people. You know, um, so maybe for all the live music stuff, which has had, you know, tricky times in recent years, maybe everybody will really appreciate now the opportunity to go to a club or go to a venue and go see a show and have somebody put their heart and soul into making music for you um, and that kind of stuff. So now when I can play in the same room with a drummer and a bass player again, it'll oh be my very goodness. exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be super exciting. Yeah, I used to take it for granted and I don't think I ever will again. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so hopefully that's the plus side of this whole thing is everybody will realize, man, I miss people, man. I miss being around uh, my, my kindred spirits and my friends and man, I miss just going to the music store to go buy my pack of strings instead of ordering them online, and, you know, uh, you know, or being able to try a guitar, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, everybody's Jones and just for that um, yeah. the kind of thing. If somebody uh, that's listening wants to email you, what email should they use? Um, they can use info at theguitarsanctuary.com. Uh, we'll get to our main inbox and we will uh, route it to the appropriate people as we need to from there. But, you know, I say the appropriate people. We're a small uh, organization, you know, in terms of our normal everyday staff. There's six people here in the store. Um, it's funny. We get people that call and go, hey, can I speak to the guitar department? And I go, well, we are the guitar department. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't anybody here that that's not um, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, just reach out to us. Um, we've got all of our individual emails posted on our website as well um, and stuff, but we're all here to help you and we'll all route you to the right person to answer your questions or things like that. Um, if you're interested in lesson stuff, Shane at the guitar sanctuary.com. Shane is, is working from home right now because we're doing all the lessons online and virtually and stuff. So he's uh He's juggling all that stuff, or as we always say, he's herding the kittens um, with trying to keep everybody's lessons on schedule and managing 15 teachers' uh, daily schedules with, uh, with kids and folks doing that stuff. But that's been interesting, too, you know, that we're having people now that, you know, maybe didn't have a chance to take lessons because of their work schedule or other stuff that can do lessons right now um, and stuff. So um, we're interested to see. We think we'll have a bit of a hybrid of our lesson program moving forward where maybe we do virtual lessons and in-store lessons going forward all the time. So it'll be interesting to see how everybody evolves and adapts as this all winds down hopefully soon. It will, but uh, I'm hopeful and it sounds like you are too and it sounds like you guys are doing the right things. And I know we need to let you get back to your day. Um, thank you very much for, for coming on and talking to our listeners. Absolutely, thank you. You know, like I said, you're, you're one of those people that we're happy to have in the Sanctuary family. Um, your passion for the stuff that uh, the gear and the stuff we do is why we do it. It's people like you that get us excited about coming in every day and doing what we do because um, it's not just a nameless, faceless transaction. It's, hey, here comes that person in who's a friend of ours who helps support the store, certainly by the purchases, but is somebody that we just love hanging out with and talking about music and talking about gear and getting excited about it. Like I said, you know, uh, when we lose that stuff, there won't be a guitar sanctuary anymore. You know, well, that's kind of you to say, and I, I can't wait till I can come back in. Absolutely. Yeah, so... Any final words for our listeners out uh, there? Everybody out there, stay safe. 
Um, keep playing, keep practicing, keep writing, take this time to maybe push yourself in a new direction, do something that you haven't done before, man, go on YouTube. And I found this place the other day that had all these super cool backing tracks to play along to, um, the resources that are out there now for a, a person playing or wanting to expand what they're doing are so amazing. Um, so put yourself in an uncomfortable situation, start learning a style that you've never played before um start jamming with some stuff um jhs has that cool finish our song challenge and i've seen a bunch of other things like that where they put out a rhythm track and they want everybody to write your own melody over top of it and submit that video back and they're giving away prizes and stuff like that man that stuff is cool um so take this opportunity to do some of that stuff get playing and uh when you have the opportunity when uh when you're you're fellow folks in your house are going out on that run or that bike ride, for God's sake, turn your amp up. <laughs> That's the perfect spot to end. Thank you so much, Brian. The Guitar Sanctuary, Absolutely. everybody. Thanks, Jed. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everybody, for another episode of Gear and Gigs. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And please check us out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and, of course, YouTube. For Brian Meter and the Guitar Sanctuary, I'm Jed Stone. We'll see you next time.